Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Open STEM Labs at the Open University. I'm Dave Rothery, Professor of Planetary Geosciences, and I'm the chair of S283. And with me here in the studio, I have my colleague Nisha Ramkisun, who's a postdoctoral researcher. Yeah, hi. Thank you for coming, Nisha. And live from Sapporo, Japan, my S282 colleague, Helen Fraser. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll be hearing a lot from Helen in a, in a little while. The main purpose of this evening is to hear from you and answer questions. We've had some questions in advance, which we're going to answer. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat because I'll be keeping an eye on that. We've also got some widgets there asking you what you're studying, what your favourite moon is and, and where are you. So, yeah, please fill those in at some point. We like, we like to get some feedback from you. Um, okay, so let's let's make a start. Um, oh, I just wanted to mention before going to Nisha, we're very excited here because news has just broken that there's a paper in Nature tomorrow, co-authored by three of our OU colleagues, um, about the discovery of a planet around Barnard star, which is the closest star to the Sun after the Alpha Centauri system. It's a three Earth mass rocky planet just beyond the snow line, so very cold and icy, but a, a an Earth-like planet orbiting Barnard's star, which is, which is great news. And well done, Carol Haswell and John Barnes for that. That's really good to hear. Yeah, it's very exciting. OK, Nisha, you don't work on exoplanets. You work on <laughs> things close to home. So yeah. please tell folk what you do. Um, so I work on looking at, well, identifying potential biosignatures that could occur on Mars as a result of microbial activity. So these particular types of so these particular biosignatures can be in the form of geochemical uh, signatures. So these could be changes in uh, water chemistry or changes to mineralogy um, or even orga organic compounds that could be found there. So to do that, um, to do this, I have to first sort of simulate the Martian environment. Yeah, you've got lab. a bit of Mars there, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, so right here I've got a bit of Martian meteorite. And from the sort of chemistry of this meteorite and the chemistry we've obtained from um, landers and rovers, I'm able, we're able to really identify uh, the chemistry of Mars. So one of the main things is that it's much richer in iron uh, than compared to Earth. And then using that chemical data, I can then use rocks and minerals, um, mixtures of rocks and minerals, uh, to make up simulants to represent the same sorts of chemistry. So here I've got a sample of a uh, simulant that I've made up in the lab. So we've got a mixture of olivines, uh, feldspars, and there's also an iron silicate glass in there, which is rich in iron. So the feldspars are the white bits, and yeah. the black stuff is the olivines the, and the, the iron, iron silicate, yeah, silicate glass. glass. Okay, yeah. To increase so what do you do with that to see if it can support life? So using that, I then um, sort of use computer models to determine sort of water fluid that will the water chemistry, sorry, that would occur as a result of interactions with this, and yeah. that sort of makes up our chemical environment. And then I can put that essentially into an experiment. So here we've got essentially Mars in a bottle. So we've got our silicate material, um, a fluid that we've derived from the uh, interaction with this simulant. And then the headspace, which is sort of the gas at the top, um, is a Martian gas. So it's just predominantly CO2 ice. And that's at CO2. Mars atmospheric pressure, is it? Like seven uh, millibars or something? No, not, not this one. Okay. <laughs> so this is just that sort of ambient conditions. Okay. Um, but we can simulate the Martian subsurface by putting it into a pressure device um, where we can uh, control the pressures and temperatures that you could find mm -hmm. in the subsurface. Um, so to identify any biosignatures, we have to run this experiment twice. So we run one as a control with no microbes in them, which is this first bottle here. And then the second bottle is our biotic experiment. And as you can see, um, it's a lot darker when compared to the control, our abiotic. And this is because this has microbial a microbial community in there. So that dark stained water is stained by the microbes? Yeah, it's okay. a result of their interaction with that environment. Right. Um, so then we can look for our biosignatures um, by analysing the silicate material and the water fluid um, once we end the experiment. Um, and we use different techniques such as a scanning electron microscope to look for morphological changes or mineralogical changes through uh, Raman spectroscopy. Okay. And, that, and we have a Mars lander, a European Mars lander, that's going to land on Mars, ExoMars rover in what, 
2020. Is that the launch or the landing? So the launch will be in 2020 and it will actually land, I think it's July 2021. Okay, you can show us where it's going it on this globe, be, can't you? Uh, yeah, so it should be right here. So that is so um, Oxia Oxia Planum. Okay. Yeah, so that's a clay rich area. Um, and it's it's clay rich because we think it's been interacting with lots of water in the in its past. So it's a potential area for uh, any sort of life to have occurred. And hopefully, well not hopefully, but we could potentially find some of these biosignatures um, in that area. Okay, thank you. And before we move on to Helen, there's a NASA lander in sight, which is landing within the next 10 days or so on the uh, other side of the globe, yeah. isn't it? So if we move the globe around, it's actually landing right here in uh, Elysium, sorry. So this is, is a, right this is a lander which isn't looking for life. It's got seismometers, a seismometer on board yeah. to look at the Mars quakes and to tell us the core size of Mars, hopefully. Yeah, so it'll provide us with information on the internal structure, but it's also got um, a sort of a thermal probe that will go deep inside, that will go about 16 feet inside um, the planet to look at heat flow, so heat yeah. moving out. Heat flow is pretty important on planets, terrestrial planets. We've got yeah. very few data on these, so that's an exciting mission as well. There's a lot yeah. of British involvement in Insight as well. Yeah, isn't there it? are. So I think, yeah. There okay, are. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Nisha. Helen, how is Japan? Tell us why you're in Japan and, and what you're all about, please. All oh, right. So um, a few of you might know me because I chair S282, which is the sister course to S283, which is in astronomy. And um, when I'm not doing that, I am an astronomer and I'm interested in how stars and planets form. That's my research in a nutshell. So I've been invited out here to Japan to work with colleagues um, in a workshop which started yesterday. Um, I gave my lecture yesterday. Well, today for you, but yesterday for me, <laughs> it's Thursday morning. I'm speaking to you from the future. Um, and I'm here for until um, Saturday. Um, working together with people from around the world, and we're interested in understanding the chemistry of the interstellar medium. So the interstellar medium is the stuff between the stars. It's the stuff that stars are made from. And uh, a little bit like Nisha, I'm a chemist uh, and a physicist and an astronomer all at the same time. But we are interested in all the sort of elements and the molecules and everything that's there right at the beginning of star formation that sort of sets the tone for what kind of chemistry um, is possible as we start forming stars and then forming planets. So if you like, I'm, I'm interested in the steps before where Misha is, but actually um, what the ingredients are that we can make these things from. Um, a little slide which uh, can just illustrate to people um, the workshop that I'm at. So there are around um, uh, 10 invited speakers from around the world, which I'm one of, and this is the, the conference that I'm at. So if you really want to see where I'm at and it, what's happening and all the science that's going on, this is the workshop on interstellar matter. So uh, luckily it's in English because my Japanese is uh, non-existent, although I love eating Japanese food and uh, I must admit to uh, partaking of drinking some sake this week uh, just to enjoy it. <laughs> Um, and here in Sapporo, some of you may remember the, the uh, Winter Olympics were held here a few years ago. And last time I came, there were six feet of snow. And this year, um, through the joys of global warming, the snows are late. So still, actually, it's 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 quite warm, quite warm, meaning a few degrees above zero. Um, but luckily, not too cold. This is a slide sort of indicating to people what what we do in astrochemistry. Um we're interested in, in understanding astronomy and we're interested in linking that back to fundamental chemical and physical processes. So a lot of people listening um, probably studied S111 or S112 in their first year and uh, learned some chemistry or some physics. And really, we take those kinds of things all the way up to sort of degree level and beyond, you know, research level chemistry and physics and apply them in both lab experiments and theoretical calculations to the unique environment of space. And then we combine that as well with observations and modeling of the space environment to understand the sort of how the chemistry is set in star and planet formation. And so in my group, the things I've been talking about with everybody while I've been here, but in this bottom left-hand corner down here, 
Um, I, I talk about an instrument called Nimrod, which actually is in the UK. It's at the Rutherford Atherton Labs. We go there a lot and use neutron scatter scattering to study the structure of water ice, very fundamental condensed matter physics. And then on the other end, I've been talking to people about ALMA, which is the um, submillimeter telescope, which is in Chile, which um, we use to make remote observations in the gas phase of all the molecules we can see in space. So we do lots of different things in my group. I'm sorry I can't be in the lab showing you because I'm physically here. So that's a few things about me. So uh, Dave, do you have any, or Nisha, do you have any questions? If I missed anything you'd like to know about? <laughs> you, did, you did tell us you're the chair of S282, didn't you, Helen? I did say I was the chair of S282, yes. I, and I should say as the chair of S282 that I hope those of you listening for S282 have already submitted your TMA1 because uh, it's due, well, it's due in my opinion in, in less than six hours if I was in Japan, but it's due by 12 <laughs> okay. Well, we've got questions for you um, shortly, Helen. Um, right. I, I was trying to pin some live questions and I deleted a couple of them. Um, somebody asked about moons with eccentric orbits. Uh, uh, sorry, I've forgotten who asked the question, but the question was, Pluto's moons have eccentric orbits, do any other moons? Well, actually, Sharon, the closest moon to Pluton, is in a very, very circular orbit. Maybe the outer small ones have eccentric orbits. But to answer the question, yes, the outer moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune are all in quite eccentric orbits. And some are, some are in very eccentric orbits. Sycorax and the Setebos moons of Uranus go a long way out. So eccentric orbits for the outer small moons of the giant planets are the rule rather than the exception. Really. It's only the regular satellites close in that have pretty circular orbits. So I think I've just answered that one quite quickly. <laughs> Helen's, Helen's nodding. Let me turn to a question that we received earlier. This is from an S282 student, Peter Norman. Um, he says, there's much debate about the origin of water on the Earth, comets, asteroids, planetary embryos, the solar nebula. But do we know when water appeared in abundance and does this help us establish its source? I seem to remember that life appeared quite soon after the late heavy bombardment. Does this suggest that liquid water accumulated over a relatively short period of time early in Earth's history? If so, what are the sources and mechanisms? Um, what do we know about where and when the Earth got its water? Who wants to kick this one off? Um, Helen. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm quite happy to talk a little moment. I, I actually think this is quite an interesting question, isn't it? Because uh, Peter, was it, that asked the question. So, Peter, there's an interesting question about when the Earth got its water, but there's also an interesting question, if the water was delivered to the Earth, where did that water come from? And funnily enough, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and start with the second bit of that question first, because... All day yesterday in our workshop, there were 100 scientists, eminent scientists in our field debating exactly that problem for the, almost the whole day. And what's very interesting about water is um, water can only be formed in interstellar space um, in surface reactions. So in the gas phase, there isn't enough energy for the hydrogen and oxygen to interact and for the excess energy from the chemical reaction to be carried away. So it's a surface process. So the initial thing we form is, is water ice. And, and water ice in space is mostly amorphous and it's in, formed in very cold regions. And then we can look at the gas phase and we can see some of the water in the gas phase. And particularly understanding this interplay between ice and water um, in disks, in protoplanetary disks where planets are forming, is actually a really difficult question, really difficult to understand. But if we assume there's some water there. Um, the simple picture from my point of view is that um, that water can be locked up in comets or small bodies. And subsequently, um, particularly during the late heavy bombardment period, that delivers a lot of material to the Earth. And consequently, um, we end up with, with some, some water on the Earth. And, and there it is. And that's, in a nutshell, how it, how it happens. But we have lots of problems with this very simple picture. And one of the best ways we can see this problem is by um, measuring the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. So deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen um, and uh, significantly heavier. And when we're in interstellar space, there's five orders of magnitude. That's like 10,000 times 
less deuterium than hydrogen around. And so when we look at water ice, this water ice, which is where the water first forms is in interstellar space, we see very little deuterium. Then suddenly in the gas phase, we see quite a lot of deuterium. We see almost a one-to-one -one ratio. It's called isotopic enrichment or isotopic enhancement. And by the time we get to the Earth, the ratio is back down to about a thousand times or 10,000 times. So it's really strange. We have all these like strange differences between the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. And I think it's why it's a real puzzle to understand how this chemical knowledge from when stars and planets are forming is linked to what's happening when the Earth is forming. And of course, if we think about it as well, despite all the history the Earth's gone through, we don't necessarily have bodies in the solar system. I'm going to pass back to Dave in a minute to say a bit more about this. But we don't have bodies which have the same deuterium to hydrogen ratio as the Earth. The planets have different deuterium to hydrogen ratios. And it's not easy for us to see exactly how all the, all the water could have been delivered simply through comets and asteroids. So it remains a very hot topic. You've asked us a difficult question. Perhaps, Dave, you'd like to, or Nisha, you'd like to talk a little bit because Mars used to have some water and uh, perhaps talk a bit about how that water was delivered as well in that context. Do we know the DH ratio for Mars from Martian meteorites? Um, I'm not entirely no, sure, okay. to be honest. I, difficult questions are the are the best questions, Peter. Um, comets are not all the same. We've established that there's some variation amongst comets, so we've probably not sampled enough to rule out comets as a source of a lot of the water. Certainly the comets we've seen can't explain the Earth's isotopic abundance. Helen, what do we know about um, water incorporated into silicate minerals? Can we condense water and trap it within silicates. So when, so as silicate grains grow in the solar nebula, can they be trapping water in the, in the, in the, in the mineral structures? Yeah, that, that can depend a little bit. That's a very good question. <laughs> it gets extra complicated, Dave. You're really making it hard for me. But um, uh, the challenge there is whether we're not um, at or beyond um, the snow line. So I remember you mentioned right at the beginning talking about this um, uh, new, new planet around Barnard Star. You were mentioning that the planet is beyond the so-called snow line. Yes. So this is the, the point beyond which, if you recall, um, the, the, the water ice actually, well, normally the water ice, but a snow line is a point beyond which a certain material will remain in the solid state rather than the gas phase. And when planets are forming, they can form in all sorts of places in a disk. Um, it's very important to remember that actually in most of space, um, we have water in the gas phase or the solid state. And actually having liquid phase water is an exceptionally unusual thing, not unique to the Earth, but it really arises because of the pressure and temperature conditions at the surface of the Earth. Um, uh, which, which sort of forces everything into that liquid water phase. And in other planets, maybe a pressure temperature condition deep in an ocean that forces us into that, that phase. I don't think that we really think there can be enough water just purely locked up in, in the silicates alone. But actually many planets, there's an interesting question how the planet forms, probably form from a rocky and icy core at some point. So almost if you can imagine the seed of a of an asteroid or the seed of a a comet all of which can be slightly different i mean every rock on the on the beach isn't exactly the same um but as a global picture i still think it's 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 understood that most of the water probably came from objects that that collided with or helped to form the early earth but some of the very early water, because the Earth went through this very hot phase, would have really evaporated and been driven off. So I think it's a really interesting debate um, in, in two ways. That's why I divided the problem for Peter in two. One is how could we deliver it to the Earth and how can we retain the water on the Earth? And the other one is actually how do we deliver, how do we get water to deliver it in the first place? And I'm afraid to say we don't know all the answers. That's the, the fun of doing this kind of science. Yeah, I think we'd better move on from that. But just briefly, Colin Fraser, do seismology measurements show water trapped inside the Earth? I don't think they do. Um, there is water inside the Earth. Volcanoes are outgassing water and calm dark side and soft dark side. There's water inside, but not in a sufficient concentration to give you a, a seismic signal. Um, okay. 
I was going to say, sorry, um, yeah, sure. like radar could potentially show changes in sort of densities. Well, radar, of course, yeah. is used to show ice layers in the Martian subsoil. Yeah. Orbiting radar, you get reflections from the, the, the top of the ice layers. That's true. That's not quite seismology, though. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we do have a question for you, Dave. Yeah. Uh, there have been a few uh, questions about the Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury, um, which you're involved in, of course. Yeah. Um, so we've got a question from an S283 student, Nigel Patterson, who asks, uh, last month, Bepi Colombo set off on its long journey to Mercury. When it gets there, two separate orbiters will be released. What, uh, what different observations will they be making? And from another Nigel, Nigel Jones this time, um, from Facebook, he asks, how much of your time over the next seven years, if any, will be, will be spent monitoring the progress of the Mercury probe? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Nigel and Nigel. I am on the Bepi Colombo science team. Uh, Bepi is a European Space Agency mission joint with our Japanese colleagues, and it was launched to Mercury last month. Um, we're on Sky at Night this coming Sunday evening if you want to find out more about it. So here's the launch, a, a night launch from Kourou, French Guiana. I didn't go, I watched it in bed on my iPad. And it was a successful launch. We're now in space, we should be looking like this next picture. Um, it's travelling to Mercury powered by an iron drive. And you'll see when the next picture comes up that we've got great long solar panels either side of the rear unit. Those are seven and a half meter solar panels either side. For me that was more hair raising than the launch to get those panels unfolded without which we would not have the solar power to drive the iron drive. Now the iron drive takes us to um, Mercury. The part of the spacecraft in the middle is the European orbiter and at the top end inside that slightly flared out cone is the Japanese orbiter. So two orbiters that will uh, do their own thing in separate orbits about Mercury. Um, it's a complicated trajectory to get to Mercury. This is an ESA, European Space Agency video that I've edited to speed it up. We launch from the Earth, we go out past the Earth, we come in, we have a flyby of the Earth, we have two flybys of Venus, and these flybys change our speed and our direction of travel, swing us in towards Mercury, but we're going too fast to get into orbit about Mercury. We have six flybys of Mercury, each time using Mercury's gravity to slow us down, so on the seventh approach to Mercury, we're traveling sufficiently slowly that Mercury's gravity can capture us into orbit about Mercury with a minimal expenditure of, of rocket fuel, basically. So we get into orbit about Mercury in December 2025, and then we start orbiting. The Japanese spacecraft goes into a quite eccentric orbit, and it concentrates on looking at the planet's magnetic field and also the atoms and ions associated with Mercury in space, its exosphere and the things trapped in the solar wind. What's on screen now is the European orbiter, very big spacecraft, it's the size of a minibus, and this will concentrate on looking at the planet's surface. It has a magnetometer as well, so we get the magnetic field measured from two different places at the same time, which is great. But there are visible and infrared cameras there's a British-led instrument, the Mercury Imaging X-ray Spectrometer, which gives us the abundance of the chemical elements at the surface. Here's how X-ray fluorescence works. We've got the sun bathing Mercury in X-rays, causing the elements at the surface to fluoresce back in the X-ray spectrum, and each chemical element fluoresces X-rays of a different energy. So you just collect the X-ray photons, separate them out by energy, and that tells you how much of each chemical element you have on Mercury's surface or you can work that out if you compare it with the direct X-rays coming from the Sun. So we'll be mapping Mercury's surface composition. Um, so that's a British-led instrument mix. Leicester University took the lead on that. I'm a volcanologist, though, so although I'm on the mixed science team, what interests me more is the volcanic processes that have gone on on Mercury. We t uh, so let's look at a picture of the surface. We talked about how Earth got its water, but Mercury must have had some water, because clearly there have been volatile elements inside the planet which have escaped to space. In this view here, which is about 300 kilometers across, it's exaggerated color. You see lots of circular impact craters, but right in the middle, there's a hole in the ground which is way off circular, um, surrounded by a sort of diffuse orange deposit, which we think is an explosive volcanic deposit. Let's zoom in in black and white to a more detailed image. There's the hole in the ground. It's about nine different holes in the ground all merged together. 
That's a volcanic vent within which the source of the explosion has migrated over time. Over maybe two or three billion years, this could have been active. It's very hard to pin down. Um, and the youngest holes in the ground there um, may be within the last billion years. But to have an explosive volcanic eruption, you've got to have had something volatile that will turn to vapour as the magma approaches the surface. And these explosive volcanic vents are all over the planet. One more picture, um, the biggest volcanic de explosive volcanic deposit on the planet, that some yellow spot at the top left of the colour image, has in the middle of it a three and a half kilometre deep, 30 kilometre long hole in the ground, which we're seeing in oblique view in black and white there. We didn't expect this on Mercury. It's rich in volatiles, not just water, but sulphur compounds and chlorine, um, maybe some carbon monoxide. We're not sure. We hope to measure the volatiles better with Bepi Colombo when we get there. So that's just a flavour of what we'll do with Bepi Colombo. And the question about will I be spending a lot of my time monitoring the spacecraft on its way to Mercury? No, that's for other people to do. That's the clever rocket scientist at ESA. I'm preparing to make best use of Bepi Colombo when we get there. And there was a NASA mission called Messenger, which orbited for four years, and it produced lots of wonderful images. Those are Messenger images I showed you there. And I have PhD students working with the Messenger images to make geological maps of Mercury. Here's just one of them. Um, it's just part of the, the planet which, which we're mapping. This is a map in progress. It's been scribbled all over because we took it to a meeting in, uh, in Bremen just last week to share with our colleagues how the mapping is progressing. So we are making the best geological maps of Mercury we can to set the context for the observations that Bepi Colombo will make. There's a lot of science still to come out of Messenger. Um, so we will not be idle while Bepi Colombo is on its seven-year cruise to Mercury. Okay, we can just okay. put that on the floor. Yes, Helen. Hey, um, I think this is really amazing because quite a lot of today so far we've been talking about things like how water gets to planets or, or how they form. But actually, even when a planet is formed, you know, it just strikes me while you're talking about Bepi Colombo and Mercury in particular. We think of this as a sort of tiny dot in the sky in the in the, in the early morning or the, uh, you know, where we can see it on the horizon almost. The planet is a very dynamic living thing. I mean, we, we kind of forget, don't we, that our own planet has plate tectonics. It's very dynamic, but other planets are like that too. So can you just say something a little bit about why, why we think this evolution of planets keeps going throughout their lifetime and uh, what, what we can say about um, Mercury now and what we can say about what that means about its history and perhaps even what it might mean about its future, you know? Might, might we ever want to see one of these eruptions? Have they all stopped? Okay. Well, Mercury doesn't have plate tectonics. The Earth's the only planet whose outer lithosphere can migrate and slide past and get subducted and so on. Um, Mercury has been cooling down, like all terrestrial planets have over time. Because the plates aren't being recycled, we can see that it's contracted by about seven kilometres in radius. There are lots of thrust faults with the surface has been pushed up over itself. And when that contraction set in three and a bit billion years ago, it did inhibit the volcanic eruptions. They've, they, they've been much rarer since then. You put the outer part of the planet into compression, it's hard for stuff to break through to the surface. But it has happened, and clearly the explosive eruptions have continued into the past billion years of Mercury's history, which is a surprise. But they've waned. We'll, we'll be extremely lucky to see an eruption happening today. It's not like Io, the moon of Jupiter, with volcanic eruptions all the time. Um, but we didn't expect it to be so active at all, except it's rich in volatiles. It's not just the volcanic explosions, the patches of the surface where the volatiles are escaping passively, but just the top 10 or 20 metres of surface is dissipating to space. You can see steep-sided flat-bottom depressions called hollows. It's, it's weird. We did not expect this. So in the future of Mercury, it'll slowly run down, I'm sure, but it's a mm. gradual process. And every rocky planet is different. But if we don't understand Mercury, we don't understand ours. It's quite possible that Mercury, having this burden of volatiles, formed further out from the sun than we now see it. It could have yeah. formed out in the Mars region and could have hurtled in what, before it became Mercury, while well, it was just a planetary embryo or several planetary embryos, and hit the Earth and been stripped of most of its rock to leave it this very large core in a very thin rocky outer carapace. 
but still carrying volatiles because it came from further out from the sun. There's a lot we can learn by going on to Mercury with this new mission. And that's really fascinating, actually, because, again, you mentioned right at the beginning, um, uh, Carol Haswell, our colleague. So although she looks for planets, particularly rocky planets around nearby stars, one of the other things she also studies is she studies how these um, planets are being stripped away by their parent star. And she sees in other sort of um, exoplanet systems, she sees really that the, the, the star is, is destroying the planet. She sees how the planet is being destroyed and looks at the material streaming onto the star as a result of the planet being stripped away. And she can use like Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes to actually look at what the planet um, was made of and how it's being destroyed. So this destruction of planets, this life cycle of planets is really fascinating. Yeah, those are planets really, really close to their stars though, aren't they? Mercury is not being eaten by the no, sun. No, it's no, no, not <laughs> okay. We've been having some live questions, so let's attend to these. Um, Lee Walker says, with the possible discovery of the first exomoon orbiting Kepler 1625b, um, it's only a possible discovery. It was discovered by transit photometry. That's when the planet goes in front of the star dimming its light and then the moon precedes or follows the planet so you get an extra dip. Um, what extra ways, if any, could be used to confirm whether it really is an exomoon that's been discovered? I can think of one. Have you got any bright ideas, Helen or Nisha? Nisha, let's go first, or shall I? Yeah. No, you can go first. <laughs> I'm not sure about astronomy. <laughs> well, so, so it's very interesting. I know quite a few people who are interested in searching for exomoons, and the people I know who are doing it, um, are very are looking really looking forward to us getting the um, the classes of um, extremely large telescopes. So these will be visible and infrared telescopes based on the ground, which will have um, like 30 meter dishes or so. Uh, these are dishes made up of many segments, and these will be used together with coronagraphs and uh, um, various different um, uh, eclipsing properties to have a look at the differences between um, planets and exoplanets. At the moment, direct imaging of even an exoplanet is difficult, if not almost impossible. Some reports have been there of direct imaging. Usually we detect exoplanets, as you learn in S283, by more indirect methods, and we have to use those similar kinds of methods to look for moons. And actually, it's kind of interesting because there's quite a lot of debate um, that the paper, I remember when the paper came out, there is a lot of debate about whether we're only seeing moons or whether we're seeing debris disks or whether we can see rings and yeah. exocomets this way. But uh, I think we expect that, that most places where there are planets should have a lot of material which is similar to our own our solar system. And in many ways, for those of us who are interested in origins of life, um, in the same way as the moons of our solar system are good potential places for, for life to exist, um, exomoons may also be more appropriate because they ha might have more um, kindly conditions for, for, Earth, uh, for, for what this type of life we know on Earth to survive in other places. So uh, I think it's a very interesting prospect, but a uh, direct image of exomoons might take a bit of time. We might have a prospect of doing it with, a, with an exoplanet with these ELTs, but certainly with the coronagraph uh, methods, they're going to try and look for these exomoons as well. Yeah, I, I was going to throw in the idea that transit timing is important, not just seeing the two dips, but even if you don't see a second dip caused by the moon, a, a moon going around a planet, they'll both cause a wobble in each other. So if the planet has been pulled back by the moon, the transit will be late. If it's been pulled forward by the moon, the transit will be early. So you look for variations in the transit timing as well. It's a difficult signal to untangle, though. Um, Very. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, Ian Campbell's asking, any thoughts on the recent theory that moon moons might be possible? Can moons have moons? It's difficult because there's a concept of the hill sphere, the region of space dominated by one body. If you put an object orbiting our moon, it will be in an unstable orbit which will decay because the Earth's gravity and the Sun's gravity will not allow the moon to hang on to something. So moon moons, are, I think, are going to be pretty rare. Anybody, anything to add to that one? No, will okay. it be? Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> let's go on to one of these earlier um, questions. David Blythe, an S282 student, 
for Helen, really. Many years ago, I seem to remember there was a question concerning missing glue required for bodybuilding. It means growing planets, not uh, uh, working out. If, i.e., if electrostatic forces held dust particles together and gravity much larger, larger bodies, what held the middling sized things together? Is it all down to fluffy snowballs? This is right up your street, isn't it, Helen? You, <laughs> you right play with street. growing pl planets from um, fluff. So this is, um, this is a little slide about um, how planets form. Um, planets form in, if we look at this little video that's playing down the bottom, in protoplanetary disks. And these are, you know, swirling um, regions of gas and dust which are around newly forming stars. And as this little um, image shows, there's sort of aggregation of material that forms, forms a planet. And actually, um, in astronomy, we, we often um, think about this aggregation process as smaller things collecting and making bigger things. And this works quite well, apart from the fact that uh, this very simple picture is made much more complicated if you look at this picture at the top here. Um, in actual fact, planets can form very close in to the protosun. They can also form far away. We also know planets migrate both inwards and outwards. We also know that we have what we call um, a, a snow line or a frost line. So things on this side are rocky and icy and things on this side are simply rocky. And we have often actually now in the last couple of years discovered that there's a moving snow line. So what happens is as the new star is accreting material, it gets outbursts of um, changes in luminosity. And what's quite exciting with, with that is that it means that there's a, a complete change in the um, rock ice ratio in this region around the snow line. So we do know that um, uh, when things try and collide, they don't very, very easily stick. So the interesting thing is the relative velocities of particles at the very first stages of planet building is actually incredibly slow, just a few centimetres per second. Now, that might be a strange number you don't really know, but a few centimetres per second, if you were swimming a length of a 25 metre pool at one centimetres per second, it would take you about 42 to 45 minutes to swim one length. And uh, I think most of you will agree that even if you swim exceptionally slowly, that's quite a hard thing to achieve. So this is very <laughs> slow moving stuff. And uh, actually what happens most of the time is the particles bounce and they and they don't stick at all. And so most astronomers and modelers said, well, it's fine if we make the particles icy, we'll, we'll make them stick and bounce and uh, sorry, stick and, 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 uh, and not bounce. And if I come back to this picture and I share my screen again, let's uh, if I uh, just uh, try and um, play these two little videos down here. So this data is a wonderful question because it's exactly um, um, the problem. So actually what happens when we stick things together and to build planets in uh, very low sizes, below millimeter sizes, actually what happens is the Van der, Waal, Van der Waals forces dominate, we stick things together. And at very large sizes, like kilometer sizes, gravity works. And in the middle, which is actually called our bouncing barrier, Things rarely stick. Things mostly bounce or fragment. So this is a little experiment which is showing what happens um, if we try and collide some icy particles at 1G on this side and at 0G on the, on the other side um, with a target. And you can see the 1G particles actually, when they're moving very slowly, we can hardly even um, see them hit the target. The, the Earth's gravitational field just sediments the particles before we see anything. But rather sadly, you can also see that when we collide icy particles with an icy target in, in, in microgravity, in zero G, um, to simulate what's happening in a protoplanetary disk, they don't stick either. So we have a real problem with how we understand how, uh, how uh, planets actually form. So actually, it's a fantastic question. And what we actually think is happening is there's lots of complicated physics going on. We have to combine... Um, we have to combine what's called streaming instabilities with collision physics. And in actual fact, it's not a simple thing like we can just make icy particles, they'll collide and grow. Um, it's actually a very hot topic of research. I have a colleague here in Japan who often launches um, sounding rockets, so rockets that do a sort of ballistic uh, uh, trajectory to try and understand how dust aggregates together. And uh, back in the UK, I have experiments in the Open University which fly on these parabolic flights to test how the ice sticks together. So actually, we don't really know. 
And the cheating way around it is in S282 world, where we talk about um, how stars form, we say, oh, the dust is really tiny and starts sticking and gets bigger. And we get to dust sizes of about a millimeter and stop. And in S283 world, um, it reflects exactly what happens in the research world. We start with sort of things that are meter or kilometer sized, which can stick together with gravity and make everything bigger. So um, in every which way, when scientists are stuck, they kind of ignore the difficult bit for a while. Um, until people like me come along and decide to work in the difficult bit, and that's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> oh, it isn't, but it's, it's very fascinating. I can see we're running out of time, very much so. Um, Nisha, let's take this question we had in advance. I think this might be another Nigel Patterson question. Mars is the best candidate for a human visit. There's never been an attempt to recover any spacecraft from Mars. Are there any particular problems involved in landing a module on Mars and returning it at a later date? Um, yeah, so this is a really interesting uh, question to be asking right now because at the moment uh, ESA and NASA are working together to sort of do just that. So they've got a sort of a concept of perhaps like three three particular missions. Um, the first one being part of the Mars 2020 uh, rover mission from NASA, um, where you have well, first of all, the lander will have to land on the surface and then it will rove around collecting samples and storing, preparing them and storing them and caching them, keeping them safe um, for, a second ro for a second lander to land with a mini rover um, to go and collect it. So like with any, um, with any sort of attempt to land on another planet, this is a dangerous stage. At least oh. you can use a parachute on Mars. We yeah. can't land on Mercury with a parachute. There's no atmosphere. So at least so, you can save some yeah. fuel by having a parachute, parachute yeah. on Mars. Exactly. Yeah. But so, you need a lot of fuel to take off again then. Yeah, exactly. That's sort of like the, the sort of uh, <laughs> the, the uncertain area that we that that Mars has got challenging, that is challenging for landing on Mars and getting samples back from there. And because we don't really have an environment on Earth that would mimic the Martian environment enough uh, to, to be able to really understand how to do that as best. But I mean, there are still concepts of working on, on it because we have landed on, uh, like the Japanese have landed on Itakawa and returned sample, and return samples from there. They're collecting so, samples from an asteroid Ryugu right now. Aren't yeah, they? so they're doing it. So it's possible to go and collect these samples. Um, from Mars, it's a bit trickier because the, it's got like an atmosphere and we also have to take off. Um, but then, of course, Mars is potentially habitable um, and it could potentially have life. So we've got planetary protection issues to sort of work around as well. Um, so, so when we get these samples, we need to get them back to Earth safely. Um, and then we need to figure out how exactly we're going to keep them to stop any contamination of the samples and of Earth from Martian materials. So all these sort of um, things are being discussed currently uh, today now in sort of different types of working groups. Yeah, and you can, read about, oh, you can read about planetary protection protocols in the second S283 book, mm -hmm. but nobody stops bits of Mars <laughs> falling on Earth for being knocked off Mars by <laughs> meteorite impact. So exactly. we're probably infected by Martian bugs already. Helen, you wanted to come in, didn't you? Yeah, I was going to ask Nisha a quick question, actually. Um, Nisha, I heard, so uh, I agree with you that actually the reason we have robotic missions and non-manned missions is really it's it's a lot safer and uh, it's possible to do. But I heard, you know, that the question was mentioning about manned missions. But I once heard um, that actually, although maybe we could get there, maybe we could get back, maybe we could get around some of the other challenges, one of the biggest challenges is actually the um, the likelihood of um, radiation exposure for the astronauts and their uh, propensity afterwards to uh, to develop um, cancers or, or secondary diseases is something we really have to address before we go to Mars. Do you know anything about that? Can you can you comment at all? Um, well, you're completely right. There are certain conditions on Mars that we're not entirely sure about yet, and we haven't monitored it for long enough. Um, but the Mars 2020 rover, um, NASA's Mars 2020 rover, I should say, um, will also be equipped with environmental sensors to do exactly that, to monitor things like sort of temperature, pressure, uh, wind speed, humidity, uh, the amount of radiation coming to the surface. Um, and also um, it will have, so oxygen will also be a major issue um, for humans on Mars. Um, so they've actually got a small experiment um, that looks at converting CO2 into usable uh, oxygen for use as a propellant or for um, astronauts to, to uh, breathe. And so, yeah. Wow, thanks, Misha. Yeah. I think, thank you both. I think we have to um, halt there. I'm just looking at the, the widgets because we've gone over time. 
you're pretty much evenly split between <laughs> studying S282, S283, and both of them, and quite a few doing the Open Learn uh, module, which may uh, or an Open Learn module, which may be a, the the Moon's MOOC on the on Open Learn, and a quarter of you are, are, are not studying anything. So you're all very welcome. Thank <laughs> you for joining in. We will have another Planets and Moons chat in Mar uh, in March, and your favourite Moon. Uh, the moon won, uh, and Europa narrowly beat Enceladus into into second oh. place. <laughs> and uh, I, was just, I was just looking out my window to see if it was daylight yet on the, on on this side of the planet, but I'm afraid it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I can't even prove that I'm sitting in a hotel room in Japan. Well, I suppose I could if I um if I pick something up like a like my Wi-Fi instructions, because at least then they look Japanese, we, so that everybody knows I'm really here. We believe you, <laughs> Helen. It was really good of you to get up at a ridiculous time in the morning in Japan. Thank you for oh, that. Good morning. Yeah. It's five o'clock now. We're okay. <laughs> Nisha, thank you for coming in as well. Um, Kate and Ben in the back, thank you for making this possible so uh with that thanks to all the people who've joined us it's fantastic to have such a great audience and uh also those of you who watch later i think it's really brilliant that you take time to do this and don't forget handing your tma one tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and thank you for the questions it's really worthwhile when we get questions coming in so uh with that uh, good night everybody thank you good night good night